Okay, welcome to the session on, on all things European. Well, you can't say the battle of ideas doesn't do matters topical. Barely anything else in the news for the last 10 days. I think we're privileged to have three uh, very well-informed panelists who have uh, been following the twists and turns in Europe um, and been thinking and writing about uh, Europe for uh, many years. So they will have uh, uh, much to elucidate upon. We have Philippe Legrain. On my uh, left here, he's uh, a very prolific writer, commentator on national and global affairs, both economic and uh, political affairs, I should stress. And his most recent book is called Aftershock, Reshaping the World Economy After the Crisis. Of special pertinence to this session, Philippe has, since the beginning of this year, been an advisor, economic advisor, to no less a Euro figure than the uh, president of the commission, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso. Philip, therefore, is going to have some unique insights. But I do really want to stress, and he wants me to stress, that, uh, uh, that Philippe is speaking here in very much a personal capacity. Second to speak will be Simon Nixon. Simon uh, first worked for about five years in investment banking. What else could you do with a first-class history degree from Cambridge? Um, and after he made his fortune in uh, the markets, uh, he decided to retire uh, to a leisurely world of financial journalism. Sorry, I made that bit up. About. <laughs> certainly, the, certainly the fortune, anyway. Uh, and he's now in a rather unleisurely position of being a uh, employee of the world's uh, most uh, circulated business daily, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, in particular, he is the European editor of its must-read and very influential uh, column, Heard on the Street. Uh, and there he's been writing extensively, obviously not just about Europe, but by, uh, on all sorts of banking, financial matters over this uh, uh, period of uh, local difficulty in the global economy. He, his recent, most recent book is The Credit Crunch, How Safe Is Your Money? And finally, uh, Bruno Waterfield, uh, probably one of the most informed specialists, writers on Europe around. He's been immersed in all matters, stress all matters of European affairs for 11 years. Uh, and so if you do the arithmetic, that's pretty much just in the very, very early days uh, that the Eurozone was set up. Uh, reporting on European affairs, first from Westminster and then for about uh, uh, eight years, I think, based in Brussels. Uh, so it's not to be stereotyped. He does want me to stress that he's not some Euro fetishist. He does cover much broader European affairs from uh, uh, plane crashes to wars in Georgia and so on. Uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, you will find his insights into the, uh, 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 the recent happenings over the last couple of years um, uh, uh, very interesting. He's now the Brussels correspondent, or has been since, the, uh, since 2006, the Brussels correspondent for the Daily Telegraph. Okay, the panelists have been asked to speak between up to eight minutes, then we'll get some discussion going, of course. Okay, Philippe to start. Thanks, Phil. If we stay, take a step back, this is basically starting off with a global financial crisis. Uh, it was a global financial crisis where, on a grand scale, risk uh, was underpriced and <coughs> capital was misallocated. That was true of US subprime mortgages, it was true of Greek government bonds, it was true of UK housing as well as Spanish housing, it was true of Ireland as well as Iceland. So it is a global financial crisis. Um, it has now become also a Euro crisis because uh, Greece has gone into trouble. And when Greece got into trouble, Eurozone leaders, rather than facing up to reality, said, uh, we need to do something about this, we need to do whatever it takes to save the Euro. And they transformed a Greek crisis uh, into um, a, a Euro crisis. If you take a step back, what, are the, what is the really underlying issue in all this? Is that as a result of this crisis, uh, banks and other investors have made huge losses. And what's going on is a big wrestling match about who uh, should bear that, those losses. In the first instant, instance, the banks passed the losses on to national governments. That's what happened with RBS in Britain. It's what happened with um, you know, uh, many continental banks. It's what happened in the United States. In the second instance, um, national governments tried to pass uh, losses among each other. So you see the so-called bailout for Greece, the so-called bailout for Ireland, um, which in, in effect were covert bailouts of the banks 
um, uh, which had lent to them. So you know, German, French banks lent a lot, lent, lent a lot um, to, to Greece, uh, and that bailout went in, in large measure to ensure that they were paid back. Uh, that, that's, that's, the underlying, that's the underlying politics behind all the complexity. It's a battle about uh, who, who, who bears the losses. Um, and of course, any such battle is going to be um, uh, uh, vicious uh, and hard to resolve. Uh, and people are going to employ all sorts of tactics uh, in order to, to try and pass the buck uh, to, some, to, to somewhere else. Now, because of uh, repeated failure to deal with the, the crisis, it has got uh, broader and deeper. And in fact, now we have several crises all at once. We have a solvency crisis. Greece is insolvent. It cannot pay back its debt. We have a liquidity crisis, countries like Italy and Spain, uh, to which markets will not lend at sustainable rates. We have an economic and jobs crisis, where you have um, the combination of the financial crash plus the massive austerity that has, fought, has followed has led to massive unemployment. 45% of young people in, in Spain are unemployed, for example. Um, you know, collapsing economies. Uh, the slump in, in, in Greece is in epic proportions. And now across the Eurozone, actually the economy going back into recession, uh, as indeed probably uh, is uh, the UK's. An institutional crisis in the sense that um, the Eurozone's institutions uh, didn't have uh, the necessary means to deal with a crisis like this. And a political crisis, which is politicians said we're going to do whatever it takes to save the Euro, and then it actually turned out to be whatever it takes except this, 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 and this. And actually, uh, the space left between what is politically possible uh, and, um, and what is necessary is vanishingly uh, small. So. Um, what happened, what, how, how, how do you get out of this crisis? The most important thing is drawing a clear line between countries that are insolvent, Greece, and countries which are solvent but simply are not able to borrow from the markets, um, which is uh, Spain, Italy, uh, and perhaps soon Belgium and France too. You have to treat them differently. In the case of Greece, you need to cut its debts to a sustainable level so it's able to pay them back. Uh, the agreement on, on uh, or the the deal announced on Thursday doesn't go far enough. Uh, in, for it to have a chance of paying its debts back, it needs to cut back roughly half them to 80% of GDP. At the moment, we're, we're aiming towards 100, that deal aims towards 120% of GDP by 2020, and who knows what could happen uh, between here and then. In the, in the cases of the countries which are solvent, but which are finding difficulty borrowing, what you need to do is you need to be ensure, ensure that they're able to continue borrowing at sustainable rates. Now, the solution which was chosen on Thursday uh, was that this finance should come through uh, a bailout fund called the EFSF, uh, as well as special purpose vehicles which try to attract uh, money from uh, outside investors like uh, China, uh, Russia, uh, the Middle East, uh, and so on. Um, the problem is, is that there's not enough money in the kitty. And so they come up with this clever idea, of course, which is called leverage. Now, leverage, of course, is what got us into this crisis. Um, it is uh, it is borrowing, um, which you know uh, appears to give you more firepower, but also makes things uh, much more uh, fragile. As anyone knows, if you've got a 95% mortgage, um, uh, potentially you make huge profits if the house goes up in value, but also your equity gets wiped out by even a small fall uh, in price. And what they've decided to do is they've tried to decided to provide a guarantee against the first 20% of losses um, in the event that Italy or Spain uh, were to default. Now, that is meant to provide reassurance uh, so that uh, those countries are still able to borrow from the markets. The problem is, is that one, there isn't enough money uh, to cover, um, uh, to provide a credible insurance. Two, uh, it's a conditional guarantee. This relies on unanimity, which means if at any point one country decides that they don't want to carry on like this, for example, Slovakia or you know, Germany, then the whole thing falls apart. Uh, and thirdly, it all depends on France remaining AAA, i.e. having the highest level of credit rating. And that's under threat for a variety of reasons. And because, pro because providing these, the, these guarantees actually increases the chance that, that, that France is going to bear losses, it actually accelerates uh, the likely loss of its AAA, which ca causes the whole house of cards uh, to collapse. In effect, basically, would you feel reassured if you were buying insurance off something, off, off an insurance company, if there is a pretty good chance that the insurance company is not going to be able to pay out? And the answer clearly 
um, is no. So what, it, what, what, what is the solution? Only the European Central Bank uh, can provide the solution. In any, in any other currency union, the European Central, the, the, the Central Bank stands as a lender of last resort. It can print money at will. Um, it, it, when, when a bank, for example, is suffering a potential run, i.e. people are trying to withdraw their deposit, it lends unlimited amounts so that to ensure that even a healthy bank doesn't collapse. What's going on in the Eurozone is similar. It needs to be lending potentially unlimited amounts so that solvent countries like Italy and Spain um, uh, don't default. Until the ECB uh, does that, the crisis is not going to be resolved. Um, let me qu quickly say two other things. You need also to recapitalize the bank so they can bear the losses on Greece. I think this should come from the private sector. It shouldn't be bailouts from governments. You should turn the people, the bondholders who lent to them uh, into shareholders. And most importantly, we need a policy on growth. For now, all we've had is austerity, 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 and that is self-defeating. One of the few proposals um, which I put into the President, President Barroso's State of the Union speech was to increase the capital of the European Investment Bank. In Britain, there's a debate about a national investment bank. It exists at a European level. We ought to be pumping money uh, into investment projects which boost demand in the short term and boost um, uh, economic growth uh, in the medium term. To conclude, is the euro going to break up? No, I don't think so, but things are going to get much, much worse before they get better. Thank you. Okay, Simon. Uh, thanks very much, Phil. Well, um, unusually for a journalist, I try to be an optimistic kind of chap. Um, I like to see, try to look to glass half full and look on the, uh, try and not look at things too negatively. So this is my attempt at putting uh, the best gloss I can think of on the euro crisis. And if at the end of that, Anyone feels the need to go out and buy baked beans and stock up on other non-perishable goods? I don't blame you. Um, I want to make just three um, three simple points. Uh, the first is that the title of this debate, Too Big to Fail, Too Small to Succeed. Too Big to Fail is, uh, I think, very apt. Um, the, over the last few weeks and months, I've talked to quite a lot of senior European policymakers um, around the European Union. And every time I ask them, do you think there'll be a deal? Do you think they can sort this? They will say, yes, I do. And you ask why, the answer is always the same, because the consequences of not sorting it are just too catastrophic to contemplate. And, and I think that's very important, because where the situation the Eurozone has got to now is where that is pretty much all that's holding the Eurozone together. If, uh, if there was the slightest chance that Greece could walk away from the, European, from the Euro without uh, catastrophic consequences for Greece itself, let alone the European Union, it would have done so by now. Um, the consequences of, uh, if, if one just thinks through the consequences of Greece leaving the Euro, uh, and you can be sure that Greece has thought this through very carefully, as have people in Ireland uh, and elsewhere. Um, if Greece is to leave the Eurozone tomorrow, the f at the moment the markets or anybody got wind that Greece was even contemplating leaving the euro, there would be an immediate run on all the banks in Greece starters uh, as people tried to get their money out before it was devalued. Uh, that would then spread to the rest of to other countries like Ireland and Portugal. There would be a run on the entire European banking system. Um, to, to prevent that, Greece would need to immediately implement some emergency powers to put in place capital controls. It would probably have to put in place border controls to try and stop people trying to get their money out of the country. And then uh, when, the, uh, when it came to trying to decide, uh, when it came to actually trying to implement a leaving the euro, there would have to be uh, a, there would have to be a, there, every single contract in the euro denominated contract in the world would have to, would be open to legal challenge. Uh, as people tried to argue about whether that contract should be in the new drachma or whether it should be in euros. It would be an absolutely almighty mess to try and untangle uh, that. Um, and then thirdly, you would have to try and implement the uh, implement a new crate and implement a new currency, paper notes and changing ATMs, introducing new banknotes. When the euro was created, that took two or three years of detailed, detailed planning to try and get to that point. So this would have to be done almost overnight. So the, there's a very good reason why the euro is still together. The consequences are truly horrendous to contemplate. Um, the second point I want to make is that at the very heart of this crisis is really the issue of competitiveness. And that's why we are where we are. That basically the peripheral countries of the European Union, when they joined the euro, simply cannot, could not and cannot compete with Germany. Uh, their, economy, their economies are simply uncompetitive. Um, 
in a, in, a Euro, in a single currency area where they have the same currency, the same exchange rate, and the same interest rate, the only way these countries can make themselves competitive is to de is to what is called by economists internal deflation, by trying to, by actually by reducing their wages, um, and reducing uh, and and cutting their benefits and social security or whatever. And uh, now uh, Germany actually did manage to do this during the boom years. Uh, and, uh, and it did it very successfully. It made itself into the strongest economy in the world. But it did it during an uh, economic boom. Um, and, and that, in a sense, is part of the underlying tension in this situation we are in now, because Germany actually did has, feels it has the moral high ground. But the reality is that the other countries in Europe, when they, you know, they, when they were faced with, uh, when they were given the opportunity to borrow at extraordinarily cheap rates, at German rates of interest, they failed to tackle their own competitiveness issues. Uh, and they just borrowed instead, and they concealed their lack of competitiveness by massive borrowing. Um, and so, and they did it in different ways. In Spain and Ireland, they did it through the banking system and creating a big housing bubble. Um, in Italy and in uh, Greece, they did it through government borrowing and creating, um, and through uh, over too much government spending. Uh, so we're in, so at the heart of this issue is how on earth do you make these countries competitive again? Because if you can't make these countries competitive. Uh, again, then, then there is no solution to the euro crisis that can be permanent and lasting. We will be back in this situation again. So at the heart of this crisis is an issue of how do you, how do you restore competitiveness? And the reality is that um, austerity, as Philippe said, isn't working. That the austerity proposals put in place to try and make Greece more competitive have, have failed catastrophically. Nobody expected the Greek, Greek economy to implode the way it has, but it is imploding. And now it looks as if Portugal is going the same way. Ireland, for, for different reasons due to the structure of its economy, seems to be having some success. But who knows how things will play out if we go into a, another recession. Um, but the reality is that the debt of Greece, certainly, as Philippe said, is totally unsustainable. And it's quite likely that other countries' debt will, become, will soon be shown to be unsustainable too. Which brings me to my third point, where I agree with uh, Philippe that, that, the, that, the, um, that the key technical issue underlying the debate in these various different crisis meetings is this issue of who will bear the losses from this unsustainable debt. And that's still not clear, despite 14 now Euro emergency summits. And, uh, but a potential, it looks as if a potential answer is emerging, and it's one that the markets don't like, and it's the one that's actually making the situation worse. In, the, uh, in October 2010, the European leaders gathered at Deauville, and they made a very crucial decision and an extremely controversial one. They decided that in future, if there any country needed a bailout, as a first resort and not a last resort, the, uh, that any bailout would be, any, any future bailout would be accompanied by inflicting losses on bondholders. And that has been a disastrous decision because immediately that, that they made that decision, the Irish and the Portuguese governments effectively lost access to the bond markets. Then in July, when they had the European summit um, that was supposed to be the first big bazooka, uh, the, uh, they, they actually inflicted some losses on Greek bondholders, and then Italy and Spain basically collapsed, or their, their access to markets ended. And now in this last summit last week, um, we've, had another, we've had an even bigger haircut imposed on Greek bondholders. So what we can see, and what we have seen throughout this, is that Germany and the other euros? Uh, Germany, and effectively, is saying that they will not put any more money on the table. They have put uh, they've put together a 440 billion pound bailout fund, and they've said no more money. They've said the ECB can't put its money up, so there will be any money is going to have to come from the markets. And as a result, the markets have simply stopped funding Europe. There is a run on the there's been a run on the banks, so that the banks can't fund themselves, and the governments can't fund themselves. And this is creating, essentially, a credit crunch throughout Europe that's actually making the economic problems worse. And it's simply, I, it's simply very hard to see how we break that, how that cycle gets broken, until, effectively, Germany puts some money on the table. So far in this crisis, Germany and the other rich countries haven't actually lost a single euro. They've actually made money from the bailouts in the form of interest. So, uh, but at some point or other, unless the, uh, unless the markets can see some European see, see some willingness by the European governments to actually share the burden of these losses rather than to put them on the markets. I just can't see how the markets then reopen. And if the markets can't reopen, it's very hard to see how the economy start to grow again. So, um, as I said, I tried to, that, that's my best possible optimistic loss on the events. <laughs> and, uh, and, I'm sure, and I look forward to debating it with all of you later. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks. It's, Bruno. It's a curious form of optimism, isn't it, that tells you that <coughs> if you're in a burning building, um, don't get out. Now, conventional wisdom <coughs> happens to be right, and I would like to advise you of this, is if you are in a burning building, there are exits. Use them. Don't, don't stay inside the burning building and, and try and work it out. A month ago, Paul Krugman, the economist, said that he was simultaneously bored and terrified by the Eurozone crisis. <laughs> I've sat through the interminable summits. Um, I've even waded um, through the documents, trying to separate the tiny fragments of fact or a real event from the pages and pages of banker maths uh, and the bureaucratic um, pieties. I can testify, um, but it's boring. But for the first time um, in 11 years, I mean, I've always been horrified by the way the EU um, uh, conducts itself, but for the first time in 11 years, I've actually become terrified as the EU and Eurozone statecraft and institutions have come to give the current crisis its dynamic, its acuteness, and its form, presenting the real possibility of both a crash and the reintroduction of force into European affairs. So I want to really hammer those two trends. The fact that the EU is producing, generating, accelerating and escalating the tendencies that are leading to a serious economic event or a crash. And also that the EU and Eurozone has rehabilitated the idea and the desirability of compulsion in European affairs, evolving already into the means by which by which weaker countries are dominated by the most powerful. First, the EU as maker of crisis. The EU and Eurozone is deliberately, self-consciously divorced from producer interests or democratic um, pressures. It's actually the raison d'etre of it all. Its most important aspect and its whole attraction uh, uh, for states is that it's a mechanism for ordering politics and relations between European countries by insulating them from public accountability, which also uh, includes economic pressures. This means that the entire European political order rests on a structure that is unable to deal with the practical exigencies of a real crisis, protected from public interests, as I stressed uh, producer interests also, at a time of the biggest global economic crisis uh, uh, since World War II. And if you really want to look at the proof of that, look at this agreement. Uh, that came out uh, on Thursday. It doesn't actually include a haircut uh, for uh, private sector holders. It invites them uh, to participate um, in an unnegotiated uh, uh, offer. The 21% that was agreed in July had a rather imperfect uh, uh, subscription, so I think we can assume um, that that will follow in this case uh, as, as well. The, e the euro and the EU cannot deal with this real crisis compared to the usual kind of crises that uh, 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 that are half made up and over uh, exaggerated. This is a crisis that defies routine. This is a crisis that demands politics beyond the structures and procedures that have been established uh, uh, for two decades, especially since Germany was reunified and then tied uh, on the insistence of Britain and France into the Treaty uh, of Maastricht as a precondition of the unified German state in 1990 1991. The creation of the EU, Eurozone, central bank institutions has tied states to extremely narrow conceptions of economic policy, fixated, amongst other things, with low interest rates and keeping deficits down. The, 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 the philosopher's stone of the European Union is this idea that deficits should never run beyond 3% annually. I mean, what an absurd proposition in the current uh, world. This has always been explicitly undemocratic. The stated need, repeated again and again in Brussels, of taking policy, spending and budgets out of the electoral cycle. The evolution of the EU and Eurozone has pushed the response to the changing economic reality um, in the world into a narrow, narrowing and destructive uh, direction. Fact. According to the Commission itself, 90% of global growth will be outside the EU in 2015. And again, let's go back to this uh, agreement on Thursday. No less a person than the President of the Bundesbank um, has observed that the Eurozone's solution to its crisis um, is to come up with the same kinds of over-leveraged financial instruments that gave rise to it um, in the first place. These people uh, are not going to make it work. 
A post-war system with its origin in the Bretton Wood IMF sovereigns arrangements has been destabilised by the rise of the BRICS, the emerging countries. And instead of confronting the economic challenges, elites have hidden in the credit comfort zone where AAA European gentlemen always honour their contracts and cannot abide the intrusion of reality on their regimes. Germany, for example, tied into this whole structure by its own basic law and also uh, the Treaty uh, of Maastricht, has become far too reliant on the Eurozone as a sales area lubricated by the Eurozone credit and asset bubble that sucked in and laid waste to Spain and Ireland while compounding the troubles of Greece and Portugal. Over 60% of Germany's exports are to the EU, and there is a UBS estimate that the Eurozone collapse would see German production contract by 20 to 25%. Germany itself is not a productive uh, powerhouse, no matter how often Germans try to convince you of this fact. Any state that switches off its nuclear power stations to become more dependent on expensive gas imports during a slowdown without being brought into line by industry uh, is in a, a, a very bad way. Um, indeed. Um, we're being told there's a struggle here between the private investors um, and the banks. This struggle is a fiction. In 2009, capital worth 4.6 trillion, or 39% of the EU 27's GDP, was tied up in loans and guarantees uh, to the European banking set, uh, uh, system. In 2009, uh, uh, that struggle was uh, already over. If the Eurozone fails to manage the crisis, and experience and all the evidence points that way, the event will lead to a correction where European economies will be disrupted by the collapse of non-productive institutions and activity that represent a major share of the economy, 39% in 2009. Sorry to be bleak, I'm just going to end by being even bleaker. <laughs> as well as the tendency to make manageable economic problems and to, turn, to take manager, manageable economic problems and to turn them into events that threaten the whole global economy, the EU has also brought force uh, or compulsion back into European uh, 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 politics. Everyone seems to believe now and urge that the current crisis should lead to a fiscal union in the Eurozone. This is wrong. The Eurozone and the EU is emerging as a compulsion union to make previously sovereign states in the forms of their national parliaments and assemblies bow to austerity programmes and to adopt fiscal disciplines drafted in Brussels, Berlin, uh, and Paris. The EU has evolved as a bureaucratic and secretive way of doing politics and is now emerging into mechanisms that are openly about imposing an order, whatever it takes, uh, on Europeans. When narrow policy and strange state institutions confront conditions of life that no longer apply, the situation can become very destructive. Even more dis dangerous when this becomes bound up with a struggle of global powers, France, uh, Germany, Britain, even for their existence, in a context where the EU has introduced or reintroduced compulsion as the order, um, the order of the day. So I just want to end and just say, look, dealing with reality of the economic crisis requires real political leadership, making demands of the elite and public for European and national cooperation to lift productivity, to provide some growth. And I just want to end by saying by... For an alleged peace project, the EU is looking like a much uglier construction. European affairs are again governed through secret diplomacy in Brussels, power play, and the explicit assertion of an order based on inequality between nations and backed up by compulsion. I can throw back a couple of questions before we open up to the floor. Philippe, that was... Um you, you took on the uh, responsibility very helpfully of demystifying the financial sort of core, one of the elements of the core being the, the, the financial and the banking element of the crisis. That was very useful. Um, one of your proposals uh, as to get out of this was for the ECB, the uh, European Central Bank, to be more um, active. Print money was one, of the, was one of the part of the plan. So why do you think, two questions, why do you think that hasn't been possible up to now. Why, why hasn't that advice been taken on? And secondly, even if it was taken on, given that the Federal Reserve, given that the Bank of England, given many other central banks have been adopting unconventional policies of effectively printing money, quantitative easing, and they haven't solved their economic problems, why do you think that would be uh, a solution to the euro problem? Um, because 
Uh, the issue is not whether buying bonds is going to end the economic crisis, it's whether it's going to end the financial panic. Um, let's face it, if you hold an Italian or a Spanish bond, and you think that other people are going to sell, it, ma it becomes rational for you to sell too, um, so that you don't lose more money uh, than you already have. And if you're a hedge fund or a financial speculator, it makes sense for you to bet on that and make even more money. So how do you stop a panic like that? Well, you need to have someone on the other, on the other side of the table who says, listen, there's no reason to sell, because if you sell, will be willing to buy. And you say, well, we'll set, a, we'll set a floor under the price. If ever the yields rise above 5%, we'll be there to buy. Suddenly, there's no more reason to sell anymore. Uh, and if there's no more reason to sell, the panic is over. It's just the same as a bank run. If people start doing up outside you know, Barclays Bank to take their money out, you better get in the line too, because if you're last in line, there'll be no money left. If the Bank of England says, um, if there is a run on the bank, we stand willing to lend you know, unlimited amounts uh, so that everyone um, uh, can, can, can get their money if necessary. There's no need to queue up, there's no need to have the bank run. Only the central bank can do that. Now, why isn't it doing it in, in the Eurozone? There are a variety of reasons. The first and fundamental thing is that it was um, the ECB is modeled on the Bundesbank, um, and, and, there, and in the treaty, it doesn't give it this duty of being a lender of last resort. It's the only central bank in the world which doesn't have that mandate and it ought to have it. Um, and that is because you know, Germans are afraid uh, after their experience of hyperinflation, both after the First World War and after the Second World War, that any, you have to minimize the interaction between the printing press and governments because it's inevitably going to lead to hyperinflation. And the reality is, is that actually when you're in a slump like this, uh, you can print all the money you want and you're not going to get uh, hyperinflation. You look at both the Bank of England and the United States uh, and the U US Federal Reserve have massively increased um, uh, their balance sheets and it hasn't led to hyperinflation. But secondly, uh, the, without that, we're back to the 19th century when bank runs were common um, and where, in effect, what we're having now uh, is uh, uh, runs on, on, on the bonds of, 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 of sovereigns. If the ACB doesn't step in, these, the, the euro will for, fall apart. There's no, there's no two ways about it. Ultimately, I think that the ECB will step in because uh, if, the EC, if the euro disappears, so does the ECB. They'll all be out of a job. Um, uh, that, if you're, if you, you might, some of them will end up you know, running um, a Mickey Mouse currency uh, that replaces it. Um, Mr. Weidman, who's the head of the German Bundesbank, would get his own currency. He'd be quite happy. But nearly everyone else actually would lose their job. Um, uh, and also because the new head of the CD, ECB is a, a political pragmatist, so ultimately I think um, he will step in. Okay, thanks, Philippe. Simon, I also thought you did a, a very good a job in demystifying and simplifying and putting forward a very clear approach of saying problems of uh, kicking Greece out or Greece leaving are just too traumatic, so we can't really go backwards. Um, and that it ultimately comes down to a question of competitiveness, which I think has been <coughs> what the more uh, you know astute advisors have been saying really for, for, for a couple of years. So, I mean, given that it does seem, and I'm not sort of taking away from your argument, but it does seem quite simple then, if we can resolve the economic unevenness, uh, then this thing doesn't have to keep unraveling and keep compounding. I mean, given that, and given the, that people have been advising that, I'm not saying, you know, and probably Philippe has been one of those, people have, people have been advising that, why have the European politicians been so unable to take that advice over the last couple of years because they seem to have turned what was a relatively you know manageable problem which could have been addressed by economic revival methods in in Greece by 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 problem by by sort of uh, 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 something uh, reorganization of the banks and stuff why the, why is the political class has been so reluctant to follow that advice and let the whole thing get out of control well I think it comes down to um, there's two things I mean one is the one I mentioned which is that uh, that this um, mistake, uh, I think it was a mistake, that was made in uh, Deauville and subsequently in July 21st and reaffirmed last week of, uh, uh, of imposing, of, of making the bondholders bear the brunt of the losses while, you know, morally, clearly, the, you know, uh, the right thing to do has, has uh, basically undermined all confidence in the European debt markets. And I think that there was... Um, a lack of awareness amongst policymakers about con how contagion works, and what we've seen is this uh, this contagion running through the eurozone. As I say, so we've seen a 
we've seen basically in a, a, a run on the European banks. The Americans won't lend money to the European banks so anymore. The bond markets won't lend money to the banks. So the banking system is contracting. And at the same time, it's like governments can't borrow. And um, But the second aspect to it is just this issue of, of governance, that ultimately one of the things that's gone wrong in Greece is that they were given their bailout loans, and they were given a whole bunch of conditions for making the, for, for these loans, and they failed to deliver. For two years, they failed to deliver. And Greece is an extraordinary country. You know, this country has 60 million people and 600,000 civil servants, and Greece has 13 million people and a million civil servants. It's, uh, you know, they have people in Greece who are retiring at 50 on huge pensions. I mean, it was, it's, uh, and there was simply no, um, the, and the government, uh, in, when told to fix its deficit, just kept putting up more and more taxes, which, of course, Greek people don't pay. Uh, and uh, but but not uh, but but failing to tackle these structural issues and uh, so part of the issue we've got here and I have sympathy for the Germans on this which is why I think this issue is so intractable is that I have sympathy with them and that we're seeing exactly the same playing out now with Italy that you can't have uh, that nobody the, nobody wants to put money on the table to to bail out these countries real money. Uh, so you know, the reason that Germany will capping the amount it's prepared to, to lend and the reason why it doesn't want the ECB to bail out the Eurozone, the reason why they want to limit their exposure is because they simply don't trust these countries to actually deliver and to actually restructure and reform their economies. And, and so part of the German strategy throughout this has been to try and use the crisis and the tensions to try and force change through these countries. And... Um, and an important element, overlooked element of last week's summit deal was, you know, new ideas for economic governance. Um, but, you know, but the problem is it depends on 17 different countries to deliver it. And, you know, Greeks, the Greek government and society looks close to collapse. You know, Italy's, uh, how long Berlusconi can survive, no one knows. He seems, you know, he seems like a massive problem, but who knows what will come afterwards. So you know the, the, these uh, that it makes this issue it makes it much harder for anybody to actually put money on the table to solve this crisis because there's simply no trust. Okay, thanks, Bruno. You stressed how sort of flawed the European <coughs> political project and institutional paraphernalia is. Uh, if that's the way it is today, fair enough. But I mean, surely the European uh, project has transformed itself many times over the last, whatever, 60 years. Isn't it possible, given particularly what, uh, uh, what others have said about the uh, enormous problems that would be caused by any sort of breakup, isn't it possible for the, the European institutions to reform themselves in a way that will overcome some of those uh, institutional limitations? I mean, all three of you were probably at Trichet's leaving party. I wasn't, but it was quoted that Helmut Schmidt who called himself a grandfather of the uh, of the euro? Uh, his take on it was that simply there's a lack of uh, political imagination and, and creativity that the leaders aren't like they were in his day, you know, uh, statesmen, uh, and really with a bit more political courage um, they could actually get through this. I mean, isn't it possible through political courage and creativity and imagination to actually salvage something and move forward? Um, <clears throat> I, I'm sure it could be, um, but we need to look at. What, what, what's intrinsic to the character of, of EU Eurozone um, uh, institutions that means they are uh, unable uh, uh, to take uh, that leap. And we have to look at some of the things that we've presented as, um, uh, as facts. We need to ask ourselves why it is that a country like um, Greece, which has always been a bit of a crock um, economically and uh, only represents you know, around about 2% no of European... Me. Uh, uh, GDP. How, how, how is it possible that such a, a, an economically insignificant country, 2% of GDP, can tear down um, the EU? Well, it's because the EU is over leveraged. I mean, Philippe explained it. It's when something's over -le leveraged, tiny little fluctuations um, can bring the whole edifice uh, crashing down. So that's really important from the point of view of politics. The solution to the Eurozone's problems, the political courage and political leadership, that is required is to move away from ideas that more credit can, can solve this crisis. And the EU institutions are utterly incapable of doing that. Their response to the fact that they are over leveraged, which is creating this whole crisis, which has a real possibility of stopping the European economy. Remember how much uh, UBS estimated the Eurozone collapse would, would wipe off uh, German production a quarter. Um, that's a pretty catastrophic um, economic event akin to the 1930s almost. 
The solution is to move away from credit to talk in financial terms, is to move away from credit and to talk about um, in investment. It is rational for, for markets, um, to the extent that they're ever rational, to abandon um, European bonds because that's not where the growth is. You invest money where it's going to grow. You don't invest money um, where all the uh, um, assets are already uh, in hock to about 45 different people and it's really in difficult because you haven't even got the paper uh, uh, quite often uh, uh, to work it away. To move towards investment, um, to w move towards increasing productivity in European societies is going to require some kind of collective effort. It's going to require a huge leap of imagination. It's going to require sacrifices from people um, in order to transform European um, societies so they can become more competitive. What's the difference uh, between uh, a bit making sacrifices and being a sacrifice? The difference is that making sacrifices, which by the way, all people do throughout their lives, you bring up a family, you make um, a sacrifice. People are prepared to make sacrifices when they're involved, when they're running things, when they're in charge, when they've been convinced. The problem with the EU is it's the opposite of that. The EU doesn't argue with people, it doesn't convince people, it doesn't take people with them, it acts behind their backs. And people are right to assume that if the EU um, is in charge, they won't be making sacrifices, they will be the sacrifice. And that is what we're seeing today, in, particularly in the periphery, so-called periphery, uh, a, a very kind of imperial style of language, I have to say. Okay, time of course is very short, so I wanna, I'm just going to keep some time at the end for the, the three panellists to come back. Uh, so, as many quick fire points as we can get here. So, just picking up from that last point, Bruno, what I don't follow in the logic of how this may uh, work out is that if we're realistic, is it not the case that that collective uh, sacrifice by the people of Europe is not going to be made? Instead, what will happen is that Germany, as the most uh, obvious expression of the competitiveness problem, will pop out, right? So if, if German leaders have some imaginative uh, thinking and some courage, right, would it not be the case that they will say, fine, we'll restructure the German economy to make it uh, profitable and competitive because that's in our interest to do so, and uh, goodbye, right? So the, the imagination and uh, creativity that would be required to save the euro, would they not be... Uh, the thing that will necessarily unravel uh, the euro and there will be winners and losers. It does not have to work out that way. Someone said, like, these bad economies need to reform their economic systems and I, I would like to know a little bit what you mean by that, but if you look at Greece, it's not like they can go into parliament and change their economic system and make it work. As I see it, they have a culture of klepto-socialism, if you want, or, or uh, I don't know, a, a, a culture of slackers basically, and to, to go and say that, well, just reform it. Uh, the whole society, as I see it, they, they demand, they go out and burn down the city when they can't go into pension at the age of 50, for example. I think that's a more of a cultural problem, and it's not a political decision to take. And how do you solve that? Yeah, what really amazes me about the Eurozone crisis is not that it's happening now, but that it's taken so long uh, to uh, manifest itself. Uh, because there is a fundamental st structural problem with the Eurozone. And it isn't just competitiveness, which <clears throat> Simon alluded to, although that problem has got even more pronounced over the last decade or so. It is to me that the Eurozone itself is a mechanism for avoiding economic restructuring. And that just doesn't originate in the last year or two. That's right at the heart of the Eurozone. Because essentially what it was was a mechanism for uh, pushing credit to what are now called the peripheral countries, like Italy, Spain, Greece, Portugal, and so on. Uh, keeping living standards down in countries like Germany and the Netherlands, uh, and then Germany and the Netherlands would export to the peripheral countries, which would benefit from this kind of credit bubble that the Eurozone helped create. So all sides, not just Greece, not just the so-called klepto socialists in Greece, all sides, Germany, the Netherlands on the one hand, uh, Greece, Portugal, Spain, Italy on the other hand, were colluding in this mechanism for evading economic restructuring through extending credit. And now they're talking about finding solutions, and the only solution they have is extending yet more credit. Uh, it doesn't take a genius to see that it just doesn't add up, and it will not be a solution. The, the, looking at the too small to succeed part of this um, uh, title, it, isn't it a case that for federated states to succeed, that political union 
needs to precede um, fiscal and monetary union and not the other way around. And that what the European project has been about has been uh, the elites of Europe trying to avoid winning the political argument for a proper political union and instead through a process of stealth and as Bruno said behind the scenes manipulation almost trying to strong arm the people in Europe uh, into a, a political union which they've never won the argument for. Yeah, I mean, I think it's good to be um, quite cautious um, in terms of um, what could happen and, and, and so on. But on the question of uh, Germany pulling out, I, th I see it as sort of one of the lower probabilities. I think what, what, because Germany's got so much out of the Eurozone, basically it has its own protected market there in the Eurozone. And uh, why should it give that up? But what could happen if it just sort of becomes too difficult is some of the weaker uh, countries could be chucked out like Greece. Um, and then the, uh, the sort of, uh, the, the rather more prudent, fiscally prudent countries could go towards a fiscal union. And that's, that's the most likely scenario in my view. I, I mean, I agree with the, 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 the critique of, of the, the politics of, of, of the Eurozone and so on, but, but I think that they will muddle through. Just one more thing is that when the Latin American debt crisis took place in the 80s, um, it took five years for the American banks and the American government to reach a solution, um, you know, with the Brady Plan. It, it, so countries were defaulting from 80 to 82, and it wasn't until 86, 87 that they solved it, and that was a centralized government. So I know, you know, things are really urgent in the Eurozone, but the fact that it's taking this long, um, partly it's deliberate, um, time is needed to sort things out, and partly, I don't think it's it's that bad uh, compared with the U.S. experience. I guess um, to the first speaker, I'd just like to raise this um, this issue about the ECB becoming um, the um, the sort of the lender of last resort, if you like. Uh, uh, two queries about that, I guess. Um, you may know better than I do. Um, I guess one of the isn't one of the concerns with that that actually that would probably require some kind of treaty change, and in an awful lot of those countries would therefore require referendum. Um, now, first of all, could you, you know, would that have to be referendum amongst people who are part of the of the euro? Would it have to be uh, a referendum, for example, in Britain, where um, the new government has now guaranteed a right to that if there's any treaty change? The second thing, I guess, about that is, so, so, so first of all, do you think people would really buy that, even if it was on the table? Um, and secondly, on top of that, I guess, isn't maybe even doing that one of the difficulties of that, this, that we're actually just putting off the crisis by actually uh, allowing people to continue to lend when probably they shouldn't be. Cameron yesterday in Australia said that Britain and British sovereignty is under attack from the EU, in particular um, with relation to the City of London and the overseas territories, which otherwise are known as tax havens. So I'm just wondering what this crisis in the Eurozone is having, what effect it is having upon Britain. I wonder how many people in the audience have heard of Marie Giochen Quinn. She's the Commissioner for Innovation uh, in Europe, for whom none of us voted. Uh, and I put it to you that uh, I'm surprised by your remarks on Germany, Simon. I mean, they have SAP in software. They have Volkswagen in cars. Uh, that's about it in terms of international competitiveness compared with China. They're selling a lot of cars to China, but they have an innovation crisis as well. Isn't it the case that we need not just infrastructure investment or construction, but a whole lot more R&D for the competitiveness of the Eurozone bloc as a whole to uh, approach that of Singapore or China or whatever? And in that light, it's not only the hostility to nuclear power that Bruno rightly refers to, it's an astonishing decision for Merkel, a chemist, uh, to make, but uh, also you know, hostility to reforming the common agricultural policy uh, and with something like genetically modified foods. So my reply to the title is, too big to fail, maybe, too small-minded to succeed. When the Eurozone, uh, you know, EU was set up and everything else, one of the factors um, was to do with making sure that Germany wasn't too powerful uh, and that... Uh, but haven't we now like come around full circle in that given the crisis in all these other countries and even France, you know, possibility of losing its triple rating and everything, and it does appear from looking, uh, reading about the Wednesday, Thursday discussions, 
that Germany has certainly emerged once more, uh, uh, you know, relative to the others, very powerful. So is it not right? Like defeated the whole kind of reason as to why the Eurozone, you know, at least one of the factors in making sure Germany wasn't too powerful at that time, but now it appears that it is powerful. So I think the reason that Germans are selling cars to China is that Germany is um, operating with even more rigged currency than the Chinese, i.e. that the, uh, the euro is, is working out very well for the Germans, it's allowing them to export a currency much lower than it ought to be, and isn't in fact the commitment of the uh, German, of German industry to that rigged currency, one reason why the Germans won't allow reform in the, uh, in the ECB. Leslie's question, how it's affecting the UK, first of all, it's helping to push us back into recession. Financially, um, banks and investors are exposed and therefore are going to make losses. And regulatory, because um, EU regul regulatory decisions, mostly on finance, but elsewhere also affect the EU. Secondly, on the, on the question of ECB and treaty change, no, it doesn't require treaty change. The ECB already is buying bonds just in small amounts. On, it's buying them on the secondary market, not on the primary market. I, it's, not, um, it's not direct monetary financing. It's buying them off other investors, and that is permitted. Uh, in terms of, I want to question the, the notion that Germany is strong and successful. Uh, it isn't. Germany, actually's policy for the past 10 years has been holding down wages. Uh, and it's been holding down wages because it's a mercantilist um, country dominated by the corporate export interests. Um, and if you look at, you know, what is the purpose of making things? The purpose of making things is in order to be able to pay higher wages. And on that, on that front, Germany is a big flop. Um, uh, and um, German living standards are actually a, a roughly the same as they were a decade ago. By that standard, Greece has actually done much better uh, than, than, than Germany. <laughs> um, and um, th that does have real consequences for others, um, because, because it is determined uh, to export more than it buys from others, it is determined to run a current account surplus. That forces other countries in the Eurozone to run a deficit, uh, and that has, is a large element of, of causing the crisis. And now, you know, having sold all this, or having you know, said we're going to export more than, than we buy off others in exchange for IOUs, and now saying we demand these IOUs be paid back in full when others can't. Sorry, actually, I think Germany deserves to take losses um, uh, just as much um, as the people uh, who it has lent to. Um, and lastly, on James's uh, point about investment, um, I mean, yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think, I mean, first of all, in a time of slump, you do need public investment. We have the European Investment Bank and we ought to be using it. But secondly, we also need more private investment. Um, I think we should have 100% uh, capital allowances. Companies, companies in, in Europe are the only people <coughs> who have cash at the moment. They're sitting on a pile of cash and they're not investing. Mm -hmm. give, them a, give them an incentive to invest by saying for the next couple of years you can invest and, it, and basically it will be tax deductible. Um, more importantly, we need policies to, to, to encourage innovation uh, you're absolutely right. And why is there no Silicon Valley um, in Europe? Um, there are a variety of reasons, but I can't tell you now, but <laughs> we definitely need one. Thank you. Great. Simon. Yes, picking up on the point about Germany. Um, uh, I think there's more to Germany than SAP and VW. I mean, they do have um, the, this in, enormous wealth of small and medium-sized companies, the Mitchell Stand, which has been phenomenally successful over the last decade or so and is actually the sort of engine of their economy now. But I think you raise a very important point which uh, gets overlooked, which is that um, that the European project, uh, at the heart of it, is the single market. And how can you have a single currency without a single market? And the single market was never really fully driven through. And that is the right, and that really is right at the heart of this competitive issue as well, uh, which is that you still really have protectionism across the eurozone. So you still have fragmented energy markets, banking markets. Uh, you know that everything. You know that, that actually they never, we've never actually created an efficient single market. And that, in a sense, tells its own story that there was never really that full buy-in, uh, which is making and that makes the whole situation very difficult. So I think that's an important point. Um, on the ECB, I mean, the, 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 the short answer to the question that was put to Philippe earlier as to why the ECB isn't buying bonds and why the Germans don't like it, the, the, there's two words, moral hazard. That's the reason why they won't do it. Because basically, the, uh, what, what people are encouraging the ECB to do is effectively to go behind the German parliament, behind, behind the Bundestag, and essentially bail out these countries and to put taxpayers of the Eurozone on hook for the debts of, the, of these countries uh, without the explicit... Um, authority of these governments, and the problem with the, and this is the heart of the problem with the European, with the euro, that um, effectively 
It's not like the Fed or the Bank of England, which has one government to deal with. The, Euros, the Euro European Central Bank uh, issues currency and uh, runs monetary policy on behalf of 17 countries. And these countries are effectively all borrowing in a foreign currency. They don't have, there isn't a single, cent, there isn't a single government whose promise they can rely upon. Uh, and if the ECB was to um, buy unlimited quantities of these countries' bonds, then it would take, remove any pressure on these countries to actually reform their economies. So actually, it could end up making the situation worse. Um, so, uh, or at least, you know, it, it might provide a sticking plaster for now, but it doesn't get you away from the issue that, uh, uh, of the, the need to reform and address this competitiveness issue. And that's one of the things, of course, that worries the Germans in particular. Um, uh, so uh, yes, so I think that uh, I think the point about klepto socialism in Greece, I think, is very is you know is well made. I think that's a, I think this is right at the heart of it that uh, that we have you know you have these you have countries that simply have governance issues at their at their hearts, and so you know these are deeply ingrained cultural issues. And I just think that uh, that political and mon that it was always obvious to uh, that you couldn't have a monetary union without a political union. And I have to say my. Uh, when I f my first job when I left university was to uh, I, I, it's been off my CV for 20 years, but I'm, I'm now prepared to put it back on again. I, my first thing I job I did after I left university was to help Bill Cash write an anti Maastricht leaflet, a pamphlet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I can say it now. Um, but uh, but that, and at the heart of at the heart of uh, but it was obvious to me as a 22 year old that um, that uh, you couldn't have um, a political union without a monetary union and. And I think that, it, it, that the European people leaders did try to go behind the backs of the people, and there's never been that buy-in. And I think that, and that's the issue we have. Just finally, we're not going to have a solution to the euro crisis until we restore the sanctity of sovereign debt, until we restore trust in the sovereign promises of governments. And that requires, at some point or other, the debt of these countries to be put on a sustainable basis. And the longer that, that situation isn't addressed and isn't resolved, then people will not lend to governments and they will not lend to banks. And so this, the economies will continue to contract, the debt problems will get worse. And I don't see at the moment any uh, sign of uh, a real willingness to, put, to address that issue, to take those losses, write them off and move forward. Thank you. Bruno. <clears throat> um, I actually agree with a lot of what has been said there. A lot of those kinds of solutions which are very practical and just show the kind of manageability um, of this crisis in many ways do require you know, a big political uh, a, a big political change and it would require uh, a leadership. I just want to address this issue of, 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 of breakup because there does seem to be a bit of a kind of legend um, or a myth I should say that's come into enters into being which is that um, our Simon Jenkins and the rest that we have a rebirth of national identities that national sovereignties would break up. <coughs> and I'd just like to very quickly explain why that's absolutely wrong. What you have to understand is that in, in Europe there are um, some uh, countries that aren't really countries, Luxembourg, uh, Belgium even. Uh, there are some countries uh, which are uh, uh, countries um, but aren't um, very powerful countries, Greece, uh, for example. And then there are some countries uh, which are actually much more than countries, they're actually global powers. They're countries such as Germany, France and Britain, who when they're having to seek resolution of their political or economic problems, the resolution of those political and economic problems is beyond their own borders. And the European Union recognises that. The European Re Union recognises that for countries to be able to negotiate conflicts between themselves, for countries to be able to prosecute their own interests, it has to go beyond um, their own um, borders. So Germany is no different from this. Germany is a global power. The Germany to sort out any fundamental political or economic problem, it has to think much bigger than its territory. It has to think European, it has to think um, international, internationally. So to assert itself, it has to do it on an international level. What is lying to hand is the European Union. And the German, Germany is much more than any other country, constitutionally bound, it has a, a, a state and a statecraft that is absolutely wedded to the European Union. And what we are seeing at the moment is Germany asserting its interests not by breaking away, but by making the European Union much more of an instrument uh, for it to use. But there is a squabble going on because there are other global powers that are wedding to the European Union, such as France particularly, and Britain to a lesser extent. And this is why we have to be very, very worried that these kinds of global powers are competing 
for the European Union and are transforming, transforming the European Union at the same time into an instrument of domination. Can we thank all three speakers?